Great. So, uh, I'm going to pass it right on to APL. Thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce our two speakers uh, from the Messenger team. Um, before I do, I'll tell you who I am. Um, I'm Julie Edmonds, and I am the EPO, or Education and Public Outreach Lead for the Messenger mission. And I've my two colleagues here that are going to speak to you about the collaborations uh, that go on to make major discoveries in missions are Dr. Nancy Chabot, who is the uh, scientist for the for Mercury's dual imaging system instrument. You'll find out a lot about that uh, today. And uh, Alice Berman, who is the mission's um, payload operations manager. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Oh, wow. Well, I did clap for it and I didn't even do anything yet. This is fabulous. Um, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is this a good volume to speak at? All right, and uh, I kind of assumed everybody here could, but at least I guess the three other locations too. Everything, everything seems good. All oh, right, let's do it then. So I'm really happy to be here today, and it's great to see so many people here at APL. Um, me and Alice are going to be talking about the Messenger mission, which has been the first spacecraft to ever orbit the planet Mercury, and we've been in operations orbiting Mercury now for over two years. So there's so much data we've gotten about the inner solar system's innermost planet. It's very exciting, and um, we can't talk about all of it. So what we've decided to do for this is we're going to focus on one really specific sort of science question, and this is going to be a hands-on kind of activity. So, um, so uh, this is a picture of the spacecraft, but let's just jump to the next slide here. And, uh, and basically, I think everybody has a set of transparencies, right? Does everybody have transparencies? Transparencies. Um, I have paper copies of the transparencies, because if I hold this up, you can't see it as well as if I hold this up, probably, so everybody can see. So get your transparencies out. I'll give everybody a little bit of time to do that. Um, and I want you to find the one that looks basically like this. It's also up on the slides, so you can see. And this just shows you, this is looking down on Mercury's north polar region. And this is, um, and the idea you'll see when we get to this is, um, this is, there have only been one spacecraft to visit Mercury prior to Messenger, and that was Mariner 10 in 1974 and 75. And this is what a map of Mercury's north polar region looked like after that mission. Okay, so, you know, less than half of the planet had ever been seen. This is what we know about Mercury, this region of Mercury. Obviously, there's still a lot to know. And just to give you, you can go to the next slide, some idea of um, how this is going to work. Um, you should have another overhead that's like a coordinate grid. Everybody see the coordinate grid? So it's got latitudes and longitudes on it, and uh, you can put one over the other, and uh, then you can, like, figure out where you are, right? So then you can put the two over each other, and uh, you'd wind up with, uh, you know, a nice little coordinate grid and line it all up and everything, and you can kind of see where things are. So, um, but basically, you can see, you know, from this, there was, there was still a lot we didn't know about the planet, and it's fun to, you know, figure out just what's there, what does Mercury look like. Um, but if you go to the next slide, please. Um, you'll also have something here, um, and you'll have an overhead that looks like this, and this is a radar image, okay? So this image was taken by an Earth-based telescope, the Arecibo, um, which maybe some people have heard of in Puerto Rico, and uh, it, this was done in 1992. They were able to look at Mercury with this telescope from the Earth, and, uh, and they took this image, and this is it shown here, shown in red, and what you see is like little red dots, okay? But these little red dots have radar characteristics that are the same as when they look at the icy satellites of the outer solar system or when they look at Mars polar caps. So basically, this is, looks like ice to the radar. So this is ice on Mercury, um, the planet closest to the sun. Very, very interesting, very compelling, interesting data set taken in 1992. OK, so let's uh, compare. How does this radar go back one, please? Oh, back one? Yep. How does this compare to what we've seen of the planet? So take your radar. Your red radar is better, probably. And you can uh, put it over the planet. And you can try to you know, line it up and see how things go. Um, and you get something like this, right? A lot of the radar is falling in parts of the planet that you have no idea what it looks like. Can you see anything about how it's lining up, though? Or does people have some? With the ones that you can see, it does seem that the, you know, that the red radar, if you line it up there, is falling within you know, the few craters that you can see. And then there's a whole bunch of the planet that you have no idea. right? So this was kind of compelling, though, that, hey, maybe this water ice isn't just some crazy mistake that the Arecibo telescope made, that this is actually permanent shadow in these craters, and this is where the ice is. But this is all we knew. 
And so this is how it, how it was. Um, and if you go forward one more, you have the same image also in black. If you put the black one over the image, it's oh. not going to look very good. But for some of the other data sets we'll get to, I just wanted to let you know that you have this layer here. The red looks pretty good over the image. But if you put the black radar over the black shadow of the crater, it doesn't show up so well because it's black on black. But yeah. <laughs> so, um, so basically, this is what we do. And um, you know, obviously, then this is really exciting. And uh, we should go find out more. And this was one of the major questions that drove the MESSENGER mission. Based on, based on these data sets. So is this really water ice on the planet closest to the sun? That was one of the major questions at the mission. So we go to the next slide. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Alice now that we've set up one of these major science questions. And... Okay. So I'm sure you can appreciate uh, from what you've heard so far today that uh, in order to send a spacecraft to the planet Mercury and go into orbit around it, it's quite an engineering feat. Um, just thinking about it in terms of just the very basic requirements, what would we need to do? Well, we need to actually build something and launch it. It has to escape the Earth's gravity, leave our atmosphere, leave our planet and our orbit. We have to put enough propellant on the spacecraft so that it can carry it uh, into the inner solar system, decelerate its speed. Along the way, it needs to do some course corrections uh, in order to get to the right place at the right time. And then if everything works out properly, just as it reaches Mercury, it needs to have a last bit of propellant in order to slow down enough and get captured uh, by Mercury's gravity and go into orbit around it. In addition, a spacecraft that travels so far away from us, it has to be able to generate and store power and operate all its systems and instruments on its own. It needs to keep all its components at uh, a comfortable temperature and operating atmosphere around it. Uh, it needs to be able to tell us if it's having any problems, like Ralph mentioned earlier with New Horizons. It needs to send a message home if it's having any problems. And then, of course, uh, for Nancy and her team's needs, it needs to take a lot of science data, store that data, send the data back to us in a way that we can use it, and also just communicate with us on a regular basis, uh, accept the commands we give it, and then send us information back on how it's doing. I have next questions? So here's a chart that shows uh, a little bit of information about our journey from the Earth to Mercury. Uh, we have an excellent mission design team here who figured out a really uh, efficient way to get us to Mercury with not a lot of uh, mass and propellant. Uh, we were able to take advantage of flying by the inner planets uh, to change our trajectory. That saved us a lot of fuel, which is a lot of mass, which is there for a lot of money. And so our trip. Uh, Instead of being millions of miles, though, it was a, about 4.9 billion miles. It took about six and a half years to spiral in from the Earth uh, to Mercury. Along the way, we also did have to do some course corrections and maneuvers. And during the flybys, um, we actually threw by, uh, flew by Earth once, Venus twice, and Mercury three times. So we were able to get some good close-up looks at Mercury as we flew by, which was really helpful to Nancy and her team but didn't quite answer the, the uh, North Pole questions, as she'll show you in a, in a few moments. Uh, during uh, our, our cruise phase, our top speed at one point was about 140,000 miles an hour. That was after our second Mercury flyby. And we needed to start slowing down after that, because when we got to Mercury, as Ralph said, like with Pluto, we didn't want to be going too fast. Otherwise, we would have just shot right by and not got captured. Uh, next slide. Right, so we threw by Mercury three times. Do you think this was great, fabulous? What did we learn? All right, so there's this slide here. This shows you what, uh, this is the Mariner 10, so it should look very familiar, plus the images that we got from the three flybys, the mosaics of them. There were lots of images, and we put them all together to make these mosaics, and, and then we got this. So you can compare this now to the radar, right? Um, the flybys, you can see a little bit more, right? You know, some of those things that were out in the blank white nothingness that had never been seen before now have some data to go under them, but you'll also notice that there's a big areas that don't seem to uh, to have a lot um, still that you can't see over in this part of the planet. Um, the reason for this is predominantly when we were flying by, we were flying by the equator. So the spacecraft flew by the equator three times of Mercury. It doesn't show you a whole lot about the poles when you're flying by the equator, so you kind of get these views that are glancing up. But you know, this still left a science question. It just shows you that sometimes just flying by is uh, is not really enough to address every question. So. Okay. So getting into Mercury's orbit. So in March of 2011, we uh, came up to Mercury for the fourth time. 
And this was not going to be Mercury flyby four. This okay. was going to be Mercury <laughs> orbit insertion. Uh, we had to use about a third of our total propellant that we had on board. And most of that, uh, the engines or, or the propellant was um, used in the direction opposite to the direction we were going to slow us down. And if on, in the top uh, picture, you can see uh, this is a picture or an, uh, a graphic looking down from the Mercury North Pole. We approached uh, Mercury from the North Pole. Uh, the propellant was used. And then we went into this very elongated uh, elliptical orbit around Mercury. So why did we decide to go into orbit like this around Mercury? Well, one reason Nancy already told you, we wanted an orbit that brought us close to the pole so that we could do a lot of investigations there. But uh, why, why such an elongated orbit? Uh, this orbit uh, is 12 hours in, in time. Uh, at our closest approach, we're about 200 kilometers from Mercury at Paraherm. And at our farthest, uh, we're about 15,000 kilometers from Mercury. So why, why so elongated? Well, we're so close to the sun at Mercury. And in addition, we're getting heat not only from the sun, but also from the bright side of Mercury. So we're getting heated from two sides, if you think about it that way. So we needed an orbit that we had time to cool off for a while. We needed to not always be in the hot sun and intense radiation. Uh, so that's why we designed our orbit that way. It's optimized for looking in the northern hemisphere and to give us time to just get a break from the sun for a little while. So we stayed in that 12-hour orbit for one year. And then in April 2012, we decided to change our orbit to an eight-hour orbit. And if you look at the bottom diagram, you can see we did two propulsive maneuvers in uh, 2012 to change our orbit to a 12-hour period brings us a little closer to the planet at our furthest point. And it also gave the um, science teams uh, a, a different um, um, orbit in which to, to do some different science goals that they wanted to do at that time. Um, let's see. So if we go to the next slide. So now that we're in orbit around Mercury, we definitely have a lot of new challenges. When we were in cruise, we were out in space. It was kind of cold. The sun wasn't too close. It was pretty stable, quiet time. When we got into orbit, the uh, environment for us was very different, very, very hot, as I said, from both sides, both from the sun and from the reflecting light off of Mercury as well. Uh, we also have to take into account that as a uh, messenger is going around Mercury, there will be times where it's in Mercury's shadow. So it won't be getting any sunlight on the solar panel. So we had some power issues that we had to think about. So we had to conserve some power on some of those orbits. We also have very strict pointing constraints. Um, being so close to the sun, we don't want to point our delicate science instruments too close to the sun. So we only have a very narrow range that, that we can point the spacecraft in. So that kind of uh, puts constraints on a flexibility of when we can do certain kinds of observations or look at different parts of the planet. Uh, as you'll see in a couple slides, we have about seven different uh, science instruments. That they all have different goals and objectives that go along with them. They all want to do different things. Sometimes they all want to look in a different direction. So we have different priorities that we have to work out. And, and uh, when should we look at things uh, versus when should we look at other things? Um, we have a very, um, uh, um, a very detailed science plan that makes use of every possible second. We want to take data with every instrument every second. So we're sending a lot of commands up to the spacecraft, and we're taking a lot of data. We've got to manage all those commands and all that data uh, very efficiently. We also have to, from time to time, do orbital correction maneuvers. We're so close to the sun that the sun's gravity actually has an impact on our, on our orbit. It pulls on messenger. Uh, so from time to time, we had to do a little bit of a course correction and, and push the uh, paraherm, the closest approach point of the orbit, back down towards Mercury. Uh, and now if you look at these two diagrams on the right side, they're kind of like uh, showing you during two different parts of the year where the Earth and Mercury are located with respect to the sun. So you can see it sometimes during our year, we're very close to Mercury, like in, as in the bottom diagram. And other times during the year, we're further apart. That leads to us having variable data rates and, and um, the amount of time it takes for us to send and receive signals. So that kind of goes into our planning as well. We can't download a lot of data um, when, when Mercury's further away or when it's behind the sun from our perspective. OK, so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, can you hit that again? There should be. Oh, 
little boxes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you might as well just click them all. all. Them. Yeah, there should be five. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so to address these new challenges of, of operating in Mercury's orbit, uh, we had to be really uh, smart about the way we designed our spacecraft. And one of the most critical components of our spacecraft is the sun shield that you can see sitting behind all the components and the instruments. This is a, a highly reflective, heat-resistant ceramic shield. It's about six by eight feet in size. And all of our delicate electronics and instruments and components are all behind that uh, sunshade. And that sunshade always faces to the Earth. Um, to the sun, I'm sorry. <laughs> to the sun. Um, and remarkably, all the components behind that sun shield are kept pretty much at room temperature, which if you think about it, is pretty astounding that you could be so close to the sun in outer space and be at room temperature. So that's a critical component for us. And down at the bottom, uh, I have a note there that says most of the science instruments are located behind that sun shield um, to keep them protected. We have two solar arrays. When we were in cruise, when we were on our way, they were probably oriented mostly full on the sun to get as much uh, solar power as possible. Now that we're so close to the sun, they're really canted back quite a, quite a ways. If we had put them full up on the sun now, so close to the sun, uh, they would be seriously damaged. Uh, we also have two high gain antennas. We use a deep space network to communicate with messengers, so we use those antennas for that. And one of our science instruments um, is actually located out on a boom. It's the magnetometer. It's studying the magnetic field around Mercury. So it needs to be away from the electronics uh, with the rest of the spacecraft to prevent interference. And it has its own little sunshade around it. So you can see that there as well. OK, next slide. OK, so here's a slide just showing the different science instruments we have. We have seven, but some of them have multiple components to them. Uh, we have, of course, the, the imaging uh, camera um, that Nancy has been speaking about. Uh, we also have spectrographs that cover the X-ray range, gamma rays. Um, we have a neutron spectrometer and UV and infrared uh, spectrometers. We have particle uh, measurements on, done on plasma and high, high energy uh, plasma. Uh, we have uh, the magnetometer I mentioned. We have a laser altimeter. And we also do radio science uh, with the RF uh, communication system that we have. OK, next slide. Uh, so before I pass it over to Nancy, she's going to uh, tell you what we're now getting out of orbit. I just wanted to give you a sense of what it's like to work in mission operations, kind of like what we do week to week, um, how we kind of make it all happen behind the scenes. Um, so we are very fortunate to have really good software and planning and scheduling software specifically. There is no way that these observations that we're doing week to week could be done manually. It just couldn't happen. There are some weeks that we take more than 5,000 images in a week. Um, and you can see a, a graphic of a, a typical planning period where the, the software is showing you where it's going to be taking a set of images. You just can't do something like that week in and week out manually. You need really good software. So we do have that. And, and we plan out very far in advance what observations we're going to do for, for a whole year. And then week by week, uh, we take a look at uh, what we're going to be doing. And then we convert them into the actual commands. So we need to know like what are the priorities this week? What kind of mapping are we doing, perhaps? Or are we looking at any of these craters that uh, Nancy um, was talking about uh, what are we doing this week? How many images do we need? What other uh, scientific observations are we doing? Are we going to fill up the recorder too much? Or will we be able to get all the data down in a reasonable amount of time? Are there any other spacecraft activities that we have to fit in there with the, in between the science activities? If we needed to do a maneuver, uh, we're not uh, conflicting with any important science. And you have to check all those things carefully. Are there any power or thermal issues? Uh, have we seen any problems? Um, and then, you know, as in all work environments, we have our meetings every week and we get together a lot of times with the scientists, make sure that uh, we're all on the same page of what's going on. Does anyone have any issues or questions about what's going on? And, and so that's pretty much what it's like week to week for us. Yep, and that's been the case for two years now, and it's been an exciting two years, and we know so much more about Mercury than we did before, and this is just one example, so everybody can find their uh, their slide that looks like this, and voila, everybody should go ooh, because this is a this is thousands of images put together, you know, and it's, it's been a long time coming, but now finally we can address 
where are all these radar bright features falling? You know, do they all fall in craters, um, for example? So I encourage you to do that with this one here. Find your relative overheads. Probably the red radar will look will work pretty well to get this red radar one. You know, and compare it now to this beautiful uh, mosaic of uh, you know thousands of messenger images put together. Um, and uh, and line it up. If you want to see where you are, you can put your coordinate grid over the top, you know, to see where where things are. Um, and uh, I don't know. What do you what do you see? Yeah, they match like really nicely, not just in the craters, but in the shadowed regions of the craters. Like if you look at that biggest one in the red, um, it's kind of like this one here. It's called Procopia. This one, everybody can see where I'm pointing. You can see the whole crater is not completely filled up, right? Yeah. Only the part that's shadowed, you know, that's uh, you know that's the northward. Um, the, south, the southern part of the crater there. So that's completely consistent with this being water ice. I think what's really interesting with this too, um, if you look way out over here, there's like a tiny little red dot. Can you find this tiny little red dot like way out here on your edge of your picture? If you put, take your coordinate grid, you can figure out where that is. And you'll, um, so you, can you see like what the latitude is? Somebody want to shout out what you think the latitude is about? Yeah, it's, it's even further south than that. It's more like 66 degrees north. There's one that goes all the way out to 66 degrees north. That is a long way from the pole. I mean, that's <laughs> not really right at the pole, but it's falling right in this little crater that's uh, got kind of a shadow right there. Um, and, but that's still a pretty challenging thermal environment to have water ice on Mercury. Like Alice has just been talking about how ridiculously hot it is at this planet. Yet in these shadowed regions, it stays cold enough to have water ice there in these craters. It's ice. It's uh, it's like water ice, so it's not liquid. It's a uh, it's you know it's in this it's in the solid phase. Um, they do do with the thermal models, and we'll give some other data here. But with the thermal models, they suggest that you might need to bury it under a thin layer of regolith because radar is a pretty long wavelength. It can see through about like 10 centimeters or so of rock. Right, so if you kind of put some rock on top of it, then uh, you won't be. You can stay a little bit colder than if you were right at the surface there, and that might help the, especially in these super low um, latitudes, 66 degrees north, all the way that far away from the pole that you can get in there. And there's not just one that's like that. When you start to look at this in detail and kind of go between the two, you can see that there's there's a ton. This is not just a few craters. It seems to be you know nearly a hundred craters on Mercury that have water ice in them near the poles. So. Um, let's go to the next slide, see what else we have here. Oh, this is kind of a fun layer too. So there's another layer, it looks like this. Um, craters on Mercury have names. So uh, craters on Mercury are named after people who have made contributions to the humanities. So artists, writers, um, and this kind of thing. You have to have made your significant contribution at least 50 years ago, if not longer. So, and you have to be dead for at least three years. So, <laughs> dead for three years, significant contribution more than 50 years ago. And um, some of these names were from Mariner 10, but you can tell some of them weren't. Some of these are very recently named craters because if you remember what we saw after Mariner 10, you know, we hadn't even seen that part of the planet. So you can't name that part of the planet if you haven't seen it before. So we've been actively naming the craters on Mercury as part of some of the fun things we do here with the mission, you know, and especially these important craters that we can see now that look like they have water ice in the permanently shadowed regions. So you can go ahead and lay that layer over the top and you can see that the different names and Elvis, it, Elvis would meet all the rules technically. And I think this is a great PR activity that we haven't taken advantage of it. I can totally picture Brian Williams being like, NASA has found Elvis, you know, more after the commercials, you know, and then it would come back and be like, ha ha, it's just a crater on Mercury site. Like, but I don't know, uh, maybe someday, but, uh, but they do tend to be a little conservative in the naming as well. So, you know, there's not a whole lot of pop culture ones out there, but there is like a Warhol crater that we've recently named and, uh, and some other ones. So. Elvis at some point, you know, might, uh, of course, some people say Elvis isn't dead, so he might not qualify. <laughs> That's a bad joke. But, uh, all right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is a really uh, pretty one. There's more instruments than just the imager. I work on the imager, but like Alice showed you, there's uh, seven different instruments and the radio science. And so this data set that you're seeing here now, something you can do rather than just flying by, you can use all your instruments. And the activity, at least that was done here at APL, shows you the power of not just looking at things one way, but using multiple instruments to look at that. So what you're seeing here in this pretty one, this is the topography of the surface. So this is taken by the laser altimeter, which fires a little laser and it comes back if it, uh, and then it takes how long it takes to do that. So if something's deep, then it takes longer, and if it's uh, shallower, it takes less time. 
and that's what this color map here. So the color um, goes from red to purple and covers a distance of four kilometers difference. So you can go ahead and compare. And this is the one where the black radar might overlay better than if you put the red radar over the top of it. So you can go ahead and uh, experiment with that and find the find the black radar and uh, overlay it on this uh, this nice colorful topography. And you know, for the most part, you'll you'll see um, you'll see that it's falling in craters for the most part. But there's not always craters. There's actually some on here that have these giant cliffs that are causing shadows. So it's not just craters that are causing hot shadows. But um, specifically, if I get my uh, coordinate grid, I can give you some coordinates to look at. If you look at about, um, let's call it about 82 degrees north and about 270 east, you can see some radar right there, kind of. Uh, so 82 north, 270 east, it's about like right here. And that's actually a big cliff. It's like, um, yeah, so like right over here-ish. You can see like there's kind of a, a cliff that's falling along. And if you look at the images and if you look at the um, topography, you can kind of see that there's a, a small feature there over here as well, too. So it's all holding together really nicely that things are falling in shadow are um, consistent with the radar data, consistent with ice on the planet. So the topography is very complementary to the images. But if you go to the next slide, um, there's another thing that the laser altimeter can do. And the laser altimeter can actually get the reflectance of the surface. So this is how bright the surface is as seen at the specific wavelength of the laser, which is at 1064 nanometers. So at this specific wavelength, how bright is the surface? And that's what this, uh, this layer is showing you here. So basically, uh, most of the planet is kind of this green color, a very similar kind of reflectance. Um, but you'll notice that there's one area that's red, brighter reflectance. Where does that area fall? Prokofiev, yeah. It's like right there in Prokofiev. Is it the same place as the radar? You can like lay it on there and, uh, you know, and if you put all that, I've got a ton of layers here now, but that's kind of the fun. And this is, a, you know, this is how we're really doing this with the, with the data. We have so much data and all these different data sets kind of play together to, to give you an, a good idea of what's going on. But this one with the radar reflectivity was very surprising. This wasn't the main thing that this instrument was supposed to do. It was supposed to figure out the topography of the surface. The topography of the surface is really important for that thermal modeling I was talking about because this is the input where they take the thermal model is the topography. But this reflectance is, is really just fascinating because right there, there's clearly something that has a much higher reflectance. And what they think that this is, is this is actually ice at the surface because ice is brighter than rock. So this is like shiny ice reflecting back at you. So this is not ice covered by 10 centimeters of rock or something like that, like I was talking about maybe you need it in that 66 degree north crater, that this is actually ice at the surface, like not covered by something else. And it's not in all the craters. It seems to be maybe only in the coldest ones. Because if you look at this also, you'll notice that a lot of those craters that are the radar are not green. They're kind of a dark blue, right? Do you notice that for a lot of them? And that's also interesting because if this was just covered by normal rock, then it should look like the same rock that's sunlit, right? Like why would the rock that's in shadow have a different reflectance than the rock that's sunlit at this wavelength? They wouldn't expect that. So they think that this actually means that this area is actually darker. And they think that there's like a lag deposit of organics that's built up over the top of this, that maybe a big comet came in and a comet is a dirty snowball and it's got ice and rock and organic black gook and carbon and stuff all mixed together. Some of that material is lost to space because there's no atmosphere and you build up a lag deposit of uh, kind of the carbon rich organic material over the top of this. And that keeps the rest of the ice stable below it potentially. So, um, you know, this was only published in uh, 2013. So in January 2013. So that wasn't very long ago. It's a very, very new discovery. And hence the arm waving because we have, don't have all the answers. But that's also what makes it so fun and exciting because this is just a, a thing that we're actively learning uh, about right now. So um, anyways, I invite you to take your mini layers and uh, go ahead and overlay them and, and things. But let's, let's go on to the next slide. I think I just have a few concluding things. So with all of this data that we've gotten, just to address this one specific science question that the messenger mission was asking, you know, is this really water ice on the planet closest to the sun? And uh, the Earth-based radar, the radar signature looks like ice. Um, the radar bright regions are all in areas of shadow. You can see that if you look at the images, you know, so we have that there. 
Um, the neutron spectrometer, which I don't have a layer for, but is also on Messenger, um, it's able to measure hydrogen. And what it has, but it has a very, very, very big spot size. Its spot size covers like tens of degrees of latitude. So it can't look down at little specific craters, but it finds that there is more hydrogen in the North Polar region than in like the equatorial region of the planet. So that's consistent also with there being water ice. And not a ton more, but just, just a little bit more. Um, the reflectiveness of the, of the laser, where it's showing things, and it's showing some ice maybe is buried by carbon rich organics over the top of it, but that some of it is just ice exposed at the surface in Procopia in particular, that largest crater. And then using the topography data, the thermal bottles um, have been able to work out that, yes, even though Mercury is really close to the sun, ice, the temperatures that you would get in these permanent shadows can sustain water ice for billions of years. So for a very long time, not just temporary ice, but ice that's been there for a very long time. So uh, next slide. All right, so what are we doing now? Because we're not done. We're in orbit. We're hoping to be in orbit for another two years. Um, we can last until 2015. And uh, like I said, this new discoveries are, are only just now published. So, so what are we doing more on this question? Well, recently, a campaign that I'm very excited about and I got to present in Houston at a conference that I just went to is we're trying to image that ice that's at the surface. So sunlight is, at, these things are permanent shadow, right? So you go, well, you can't image in permanent shadow. That's just silly. But the sunlight is reflected from the crater rims into there. So if you use a really long exposure, and what we're using is we're using the filter on the camera that we usually look at stars, so very faint light source, but we're turning that on Mercury into these permanently shadowed regions and trying to actually get images of Prokofiev of these areas where the reflectance is that there's ice on the surface. So and that's actually starting to work and we're seeing some things. So it's a it's very intriguing. And um, more reflective reflectivity measurements of more craters. Um, like you can see, there's a big hole right here in the middle. We don't have a whole lot of measurements there. We should get more. That would be very interesting because the closer you get to the pole, the colder it is. And so you should have water ice stable. If it's in Prokofiev, these craters that are closer to the, to the pole should probably also have it at the surface would be the prediction. Um, more topography. Again, you can tell the topography as you get further out or closer to the pole because of the orbit of the spacecraft, you know, it's not perfect. There's definitely room to get in there. That'll give us better thermal modeling and specifically to model things like this 66 degree north crater, which hasn't been done yet at that low latitude. We just don't have the topography information to do that yet. Can you really, and that might tell you something that maybe you can have water ice there, but maybe it can't be there for a billion years. Maybe it can only be there for a hundred million years. So then that tells you something about when the water ice got brought to the planet. Um, and when the mission does end, um, which will unfortunately happen someday, but it's impossible. 2015 is the longest the mission can go. After that, it will crash into the planet. So the spacecraft is going to crash into the planet, and there's nothing you can do about it anymore. It just doesn't have enough fuel to do anything else. It's going to fall into the planet. Um, but before we fall into the planet, we'll pass really low. We'll get new low altitude observations over some of these craters. So we'll pass really low, not just once. Because if you just do it once, it's not useful because you go down, but you can't get the data back, like Alice was saying, right? So you can take all the data you want, but you're way over there at Mercury, and we're here on Earth, and we need that data to come back. So slowly, the orbit will degrade so that that part that's closest will pass by at low altitudes repeatedly for many times. And we'll have time to send some of that data back. You know, We won't be able to send down the movie of you know going there yeah. the moon is so close you people get spoiled you know seeing these things but mercury is further away but but it does have low altitude observations and low altitude over some of these water bearing craters and so that will be really in, in, exciting sort of stuff to happen so that's kind of the, the state of this and um i guess i'll take any questions or if uh, there's anything else so like, oh yeah yeah, that's a great question. Like, how thick is the ice? Yes. Yeah, basically, how thick is the ice? So people have made estimates on that. Um, and it has to be a certain thickness to get the radar signal that you're seeing. And it has to be kind of pure ice, too. It can't be that dirty. So it's got to be nearly 90% ice. And the, the current estimates that people are coming up with, and I should say, with the topography, you can, um, you can get the topography of craters that have ice and the topography of craters that don't have ice. It doesn't seem like the ones that have ice are like way shallower than the ones that don't, right? So that puts some constraint on it too. These look like pretty normal craters. So current estimates are maybe like a meter, a few meters, maybe tens of centimeters, that sort of, you know, thicknesses of ice. Is, yeah. Yeah. Something about like, like that, you know, a yard. So, yeah. I have a question about the sun shape. 
technology with that, is that the advance of the heat shield from the space shuttle, or is it its own technology? I believe it's very similar material, but uh, modified uh, for, you know, a different mission that was going to be very close to the sun. But I do, I do believe they have similarities. Yeah, it's like a ceramic cloth. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I have the shuttle had the ceramic tile. Yeah. It's similar, but probably not, you know, just specialized for it. We'll take one more here and then pass it over to um, to John to J JPL. Yeah. Um, because Mercury has the largest uh, daily temperature change of all of the planets, um, they, was it uh, minus 300 degrees to about 850 degrees? Yeah. Just from is is, um, is there is there any possibility that the, that ice changes locations or they're short term? Uh, ice that that builds during the time that Mercury is in that uh, cold, you know, the cold uh, dark side. I mean, you know, the time frame that you're talking about it changing on, you know, is a, a Mercury, you know, a Mercury year. I mean, you know, kind of, you know, a different a different time scale completely. You know, I mean, so if a comet crashed on to Mercury right now on the side that was currently night. You know, it it would be a, a pretty cold environment, and it would quickly, you know, heat up. You know, you know, some days later, and that sort of thing, and probably wouldn't be stable there. But it does seem that since there's so many of these radar bright features, and they don't seem to just fall in a few craters. If you look at that image closely and overlay those things, they seem to be falling in every single crater. Practically every single crater there has this material in it, and that seems to mean, to me at least, that this material is clearly moving around to all available cold traps. So it seems like something cold gets deposited and then it moves around and finds every possible permanently shadowed cold area that it can stay in for a billion years. And I think what we're seeing is the snapshot of that. If that process, if the material is being delivered, yeah, maybe it'll find some pseudo stable sort of places to be for some period of time, you know, until it can't stay there anymore. But, um, but yeah, maybe that's a wishy-washy way, but it's, it's in practically every crater. If you look at there, and I've counted all of those craters and circled every little one, <laughs> and practically every one that has shadow also seems to have this radar bright water ice signature. So. Okay, so we'll pass it over to JPL for questions. Yeah, I can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, hi. I'm Mary. I want to know if you could explain, explain in the, in the um, uh, uh, topography uh, image this kind of hourglass-shaped bluish-green region. It's like it's lower than the rest of the red and the, the yellow. Is that right? Here. Do you have an? So why why it's red up here? No. Um. It's like the center here, like this. There's like an hourglass shape there of, uh, I'm sorry, let me show you mine. Oh, wait. It's not data right here or near the pole. Is that the question? No, um, let me get a paper, sorry. This. I can't see right you, here. so, <laughs> sorry. It's lower than, do you have an explanation for that? Oh yeah, right, okay, so there's red regions. I guess maybe you can't see me now. <laughs> All right, now you can see me, right? Um, so the red regions here and the red regions here, and then this is blue and then this is blue. That's what, like this overall um, thing that's going on with the planet. Yeah, it, that's, that's very real. That's actually what the planet looks like. Um, if you look at your images here, um, Mercury's North Polar region, the geology that's going on there is there's a giant, volcanic floodplain up there. So this whole region has been flooded by volcanism. And if you look at the image, you'll see some areas up here specifically is heavily cratered. And there's less craters on this part of it. And it looks kind of wrinkly. And that's all like the lava flowing across the surface in this giant thing. And the topography kind of bears that out to a certain extent. Here's your older area that's heavily cratered up here. And then this is all kind of filled with a lot of volcanism and, and lava. And so what you're seeing and what you've observed there is just you know um, something we didn't know before that we're learning about um, the geology, which was another major science question of the Messenger mission, is to figure out what geologic processes have shaped the surface. So, yeah. Quick, quick.
So I'm Nancy, and I have a question about, um, I'm wondering if there's ice, it's water, uh, maybe at the edge, has anyone speculated that at the edges of the ice, there's liquid water and maybe life? Yeah, I don't, you can speculate things, but, uh, you know, and water, and I, it's always, well, water is very important to life, um, and if you've got organics there, then organics is really important to life. Um, I don't think people really think this is a conducive environment to have life exist, but people do think that this material that was delivered to Mercury might be very relevant to material that was also delivered to the early Earth or was delivered to early Mars. And, you know, what you're seeing there is also the same things that would have been brought to these other planets, which maybe with an atmosphere would be more suitable to sustaining life. So, but I think that just uh, especially with the no atmosphere or the exosphere, which is really weak, that it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be conducive. But I am not a life expert. But having water and organics is important components. So. To uh, Johnson Space Center. Oh, nope, excuse me. Let's try Arizona first, the University of Arizona, please. The University of Arizona. What you see in the is of topography that you have. Yes, about the gap you have. The gap in the center. What do you expect um, that to look like? What look like with the topography information that? The images, photography, data overlapping. What would you infer for the area that you don't yet have data for? Yeah, I mean, looking at the images is a good way to go, right? I mean, so if you look at the images, um, and a, an interesting question is like, why is this gap here and you don't have it in the images? And this has to do with the orbit. So the laser altimeter doesn't have a pivot. So it can only kind of like look wherever the spacecraft has to be looking. The camera has a pivot, so we can like pivot over and kind of look there. So we get better coverage with the imager than the rest of the instruments, which just kind of have to ride along, or you have to tilt the whole spacecraft over. And like Alice explained, you can't just tilt the whole spacecraft over because if you don't keep the sunshade pointing to the sun, everything it goes horribly bad. So. Um, but inside this area that we don't have the good topography data for, it does complicate doing the thermal modeling because you need the topography to do the thermal modeling. But you can see that there's little craters in there. So okay, I guess I would expect those craters to show up in the topography eventually. And we're, and we're getting more data every day trying to fill in that hole that's closest to the pole. So, but I think the images and the fact that the topography has lined up really nicely with all the rest of the images to date, there's no reason to not think that that would be the case. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Once it does come out, based on your color coding, what color would it be? If you had to predict. Oh, well, I mean, it's going to be mostly kind of green, and the craters are going to be like purple, right? I mean, that, that would be my prediction. I don't think that there's a huge um, topographic rise there that's all sort of going to be red. And the few passes that we've had through there don't indicate that there's any um, big mound or hill or anything. Let's move on to uh, Johnson. I'm curious about the ice. You um, mentioned it has to be pure ice to reflect, but it can be under regolith and still be detected. So I have so many questions. Are, could there be more ice that's impure? Was it all laid down at different times? Um, was there a melt and then a freeze? I, do you have any insight? Those are those are fabulous, fabulous questions about whether it was laid down all at once, whether it was multiple things that brought multiple ones there. The neutron spectrometer um, team have done some modeling based on their data as well about the enhanced hydrogen they see at the poles and what that means for 
how pure the ice is and how thick the ice can be to get the hydrogen abundance that they're that they're seeing there. And that's where their estimate is in order to do that, that it has to be kind of this 90% pure or more. That doesn't count the top 10 centimeters because that still kind of allows the radar to see through it. So you can still have the rock, but underneath that to get the enhanced hydrogen abundance. Because the neutron spectrometer, I forget what depth they can see to, but they can't see infinitely deep either. So in order to get the enhanced hydrogen that they're seeing, um, with the depth of the, that the instrument can see, it seems to be kind of, you know, these sort of meter sort of estimates. Um, but how that got there, whether it came all at once, whether it's come multiple times, how long it's been there, whether it's more recent, these are all things that are um, actively being worked and discussed. And there's a, a, I mean, hopefully I'll have a better answer a year from now and even a better answer two years from now and an even better answer five or ten years from now. But it's a, it's a really active area. Um, any other questions? One more question uh, yes. from Johnson, or are you guys all set? Yes, from uh, Johnson. And uh, I was looking at the, the messenger images, transparency, and uh, yep. there are a lot of ridge-like features that seem to almost uh, like encircle the polar area on one, one side. Uh, are these? Do you know what the ridge features are like? What what they are? Tectonic or are they? Well, yeah, the, those are um, wrinkle ridges, and so they're related to the volcanism and the cooling of the lava once it went across the surface. Um, a lot of times, imagery can be deceiving because it depends on where um, your light source is, because you see it based on the shadows. So because you're seeing it circling the poles, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way that it's going. It's just that the sun is always at the equator. We can't put the sun over the top of the pole. So the only light that you're ever seeing when you look at the polar region is coming like kind of from the equator towards there. And that makes the shadow always fall on that same side, which makes things look like they're ringing. So a lot of times the topography data, and I don't have it here on the scale. You can't see it because I've done this from zero to four kilometers. But it's actually detailed enough that if I change the scale so you could make out these ridges, then you could see that they're not really making as much of a ringing pattern as it looks like with just the imagery, that they're actually going in a bunch of different directions. So, um, but yeah, but that's a, that's the geology of Mercury is just fascinating. We've learned so much about it too. And uh, I mean, that lava flow is, is huge that is in that North Polar region and those wrinkle ridges is what you're seeing. Is the ice connect, is, are the hollows connected to the ice? You found, you think? Oh, the hollows. So a whole totally different uh, topic. Uh, we found this new landform on Mercury that had never been seen on any other planet before. It's not anything that I've shown you here. But uh, it looks like rock is actively being lost off the surface. Like you have material. It looks very similar to the polar caps of Mars, where ice sublimates. And it kind of is this eating away sort of texture and etching texture. But it's happening on Mercury in rock, not in ice. So somehow there's rock on the surface that is disappearing somehow. We think maybe it's related to the high sulfur content of the surface. Um, but no, we don't see the hollows in these radar bright craters. We don't see hollows actually in any of the northern volcanic plains in that unit at all. There are no hollows. The hollows are some other interesting thing that's going on with Mercury, but it does not seem to be connected to the water ice at all. We haven't found any connection. So. Hey, hey, fantastic. It's a wonderful story to hear all the layers of data piling up on each other. Literally, we get to hold them in our hands to see how you're uh, coming to real evidence. I was told before you got to um, Messenger that there was no way that uh, Messenger was going to find ice on Mercury. And that was an astronomer who told me that. And guess what? <laughs> we get to well, it's things. always fun to be wrong. So thank you so much for bringing that to us. Um, we're going to take uh, about, I'd say, 15 minutes. Um, let's come back at a little bit after schedule. It'll be 2.05 here, 4.05 Central Time, and 5.05 uh, Eastern Time. We're going to spend a little in-house time on our sites.
doing some wrap up, um, kind of reflecting on the day, and then we'll have a chance to hear from each site a little bit of something that that site wants to share, takeaways, learnings, applications in their classrooms, et cetera. So um, we'll see you in at uh, 205, 405, and 505.